my thanks to all of you for, for going alternative pleasures this Sunday night. And in particular, my thanks to Leicester Secular Society for hosting this meeting. Um, I, too, am a secularist. And for those who have any doubt, secularism is not the same as being anti-religion. Secularism is simply saying there should be a separation between religion and the state. In other words, the state should not privilege any faith, that faith and everybody else in society ought to be equal before the law. And that is, of course, the best protection for democracy and human rights. Because wherever religion has political power, it nearly always abuses it to attack and harm other faiths and people of no faith. So in fact, secularism is in the interests of people of faith because it ensures that all faiths and none are equal in the public sphere. Now, tonight's talk is entitled, Organized Religion is the Greatest Global Threat to Human Rights. That is, of course, a very questionable, controversial assumption. It's a proposition that many people might argue against, and I want to perhaps argue against my own position to some extent by saying that, for example, it might be arguable that free market capitalism is the single greatest threat to human <laughs> rights globally. Because if you look around the world today, despite a world of plenty, there are many, many people, billions of people, suffering great hardship because the way in which the economic system globally is organized to prevent and deny those people having the basics of life. Here I am with a glass of clean water. It tastes good, it's safe to drink, it won't harm me. But this morning, 800 million people woke up with no safe, clean drinking water. And it's killing thousands of them every single day. Yet at the same time, the richest 85 individuals in the world have as much wealth as 50%, the poorest 50% of the world's population. And that is because we have an economic system which enshrines inequality, which divides the world into haves and have-nots, into a world where some people have fabulous wealth and others are not even surviving. Now, to me, economic rights are human rights too. And it's enshrined in the United Nations Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. In that convention, it states that the basics of life, food, water, shelter, education, healthcare, that those are human rights just as much as the right to protest, freedom of belief, the right to strike, and so on. So in that context, you could say, with a fair degree of credibility, that the global economic system, which is predicated on free market capitalism, is the single greatest threat to human rights internationally. We'll debate that perhaps later during the Q&A, but for now I want to focus on organized religion. Um, the proposition that organized religion is the single greatest global threat to human rights. It is particularly a threat to the rights of women, gay people, and religious minorities. Um, we see that all around the world, the major organized religions enshrine patriarchy and heterosexism. It's fundamental to their faith systems that women and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex people, LGBTI people, are not entitled to equality and human rights. Now, when you look at diverse countries around the world, Russia, Iraq, Uganda, Pakistan, we see the malevolent role of organized religion. I emphasize that word organized 
Because I want to make a distinction between religious establishments and hierarchies and individual people of faith. Um, there are many good people of faith who do not share prejudice, who do not discriminate, who respect others with different belief systems. And indeed, in my own history of human rights, I've been inspired by some of them. Mahandras Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Oscar Romero. There are many people of faith who have done great, important things for the furtherment of humanity, who have not been involved in religious sectarianism, but have used their faith as an instrument for human liberation. And I salute them. I salute them. But they are very different from the organized establishment and hierarchy of the major faiths. You're all familiar with the recent attempts by Pope Francis to change the church's stance towards gay people. It was a very modest change, I've got to say, because he wasn't proposing to change any of the doctrines or the policies. The same attitudes towards women and gay people remained in place and will remain in place. But he sought to soften the tone and make gay people feel welcome within the church, make divorced people feel more welcome within the church, and that's a good thing. But as you know, within days, angry bishops who share the more fundamentalist interpretation of Catholicism forced him to row back. So you can see that even these small changes in tone, let alone policy, provoked great resistance from the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. And you see that mirrored all around the world among different faiths. So let's take a look, for example, at what I would call Christian fundamentalism. Um, in the United States, it is Christian extremists who are leading the attack on women's reproductive rights. It is the Christian extreme churches, the evangelicals, who are saying that women should not have a control over their own bodies and fertility. They've argued against same-sex marriage. They oppose sex education in schools. They reject the provision of condoms to prevent the spread of HIV and AIDS. That is in the United States, a supposedly educated, democratic nation where in theory they have a separation between church and the state. If you look at Nigeria, in Nigeria many of the Christian churches are deeply implicated in witch hunts, literal witch hunts against supposed witches. Now, mostly women and children whose non-conformist behavior leads these church leaders to conclude they are possessed by the devil and they must be exercised. And that, in a sense, is not just a damnation, but physical and mental threats and pressure, even to the point of physical violence against young children who, because the families had some misfortune, are completely falsely accused of witchcraft. That is being orchestrated by many of the Christian churches in Nigeria. And the people leading the fight back are, of course, humanists and secularists. And I pay tribute to the great Nigerian humanist Leo Igwe, who many of you may know, who has led up very honourable, courageous fight against these witch hunts, himself being subjected to threats and violence, including against his family, because they couldn't get at him. The churches have also been instrumental in Nigeria in the new legislation this year, which further cracks down on the gay community, with draconian new penalties for advocating gay equality, even for saying that gay people should have equal rights for forming gay organizations, for holding gay meetings to discuss issues like HIV and AIDS. Under this new law, people can get many years imprisonment. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Anti-Homosexuality Act in Uganda, which was passed 
um, and agreed by the president earlier this year. Uh, again, a massive escalation of repression against LGBTI people. Already, of course, um, same-sex relationships carried a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. But the new law extends that to any kind of homosexual contact. Any physical contact with homosexual intent under this law became automatically, mandatorily, <coughs> subject to a life imprisonment with no hope of appeal or any reduction in the sentence. We're talking about life imprisonment mandatorily for touching and kissing. Not for actual sex, for mere touching or kissing with homosexual intent. You may have heard that, of course, earlier this year, sometime after the bill was enacted, the Constitutional Court ruled that act unlawful on the technical grounds that it had been passed without a parliamentary quorum. It was not ruled out of order because it was an attack upon human rights, it was ruled out of order because of a technicality. And with all uh, the fears in the pipeline, it seems like that bill will come back. The sponsors have promised to do that. <coughs> in Russia, in Russia there is now an unholy alliance between the tyrannical regime of President Putin and the Russian Orthodox Church. The Church supports Putin, and in return, he supports them. At the instigation of the Church and ultranationalists, <coughs> last year, a new law was passed in Russia to prohibit the so-called promotion of non-traditional sexual relations. Somewhat of an almost mirror image of our own Section 28, uh, which was passed by the Conservative government here in the 1980s. Under that law, any public visibility of a same-sex relationship or any advocacy of gay equal rights now becomes a criminal offence. So people have been arrested under this law for holding a rainbow flag, the symbol of the global LGBTI movement, for holding a sign saying homosexuality is normal. This has been instigated, orchestrated, inflamed by the Russian Orthodox Church. If we look at the Judaist faith, again we see parallel moves. You know, it is Jewish fundamentalists, through promotion of new settlements in the West Bank, that have been instrumental in undermining the peace process with the Palestinians. They have also, of course, for many years, tried to stop and did prevent Jewish women from praying at the wedding wall on the grounds that this was not a fit and proper thing for women to do. They also led the charge to try and ban gay pride parades and gay organisations. Um, this is a manifestation of an extreme interpretation of Judaism um, which has led to real violations of human rights in the state of Israel. We look at the Hindu faith, we see the rise of Hindu nationalism and Hindu nationalist leaders, based on their faith, have been instrumental in orchestrating violent attacks upon Muslims and in some cases against Christians. A supremacist view that Hinduism is the supreme religion and all other religions must be subjugated. Even Buddhism. Buddhism, which has traditionally been seen as a faith that is imbued with peace and non-violence, is now being orchestrated by fundamentalist monks in Burma and Sri Lanka to oppress LGBTI people and people of other faiths. Who would have thought that Buddhism could have ever become an instrument of such vile persecution? And then we have the Muslim faith. You know, right now we are seeing a monumental historic battle going on in the northern Syrian city of Kobani where heroic, democratic, secular Kurdish Muslims are fighting for their lives against the terrorists and clerical fascists of the Islamic State. Now, I don't like war. 
I loathe it. To me, it has to be an absolute last resort. But in the case of the people of Gobani, if they don't fight, they will be massacred. This is a war of self-defense, a just war. It's a war against Islamist extremism, religious fanaticism. And it's a war that they must win. And we as a nation and the whole world community has a duty to aid them in their struggle to free themselves and to defeat ISIS. Now, A, I don't support Western troops. I don't feel happy about Western airstrikes. But there's no reason why we can't do an airdrop into Kobani to provide them with the heavy weapons, communications equipment, medical supplies and food they desperately need. The United States has dropped, I think, 24 tons of supplies into Kobani. Nowhere near enough. This is a fight between democracy and fascism. Fascism in a clerical guise. Just as the world rallied to defend Republican Spain against Franco in the 1930s, and we rallied to support the anti-Nazi resistance in occupied Europe in the 1940s, so we have a duty to defend those Kurdish democratic secularists against clerical fascism. Wherever we look, you get the picture. Organized religion, or at least its extreme adherents, are playing a pivotal role in attacking the human rights of other people. Boko Haram in Nigeria. Those horrific attacks upon Christians and the massacre of school kids and teachers. This is driven by a particularly perverse interpretation of the Islamic faith. Many of you will be familiar with the bombing of Christian churches in Pakistan. The bombing of Christian shops and homes in Pakistan. Where Christians in Pakistan live in fear of their lives because of Islamist extremists who are protected by the Pakistan state. Hardly anybody has ever been prosecuted for these outrageous murders and bombings in Pakistan. And right now, a Christian mother, Asia Bibi, is facing a death sentence over a dispute at a water well where she allegedly said something that was insulting to Islam. She's been accused and put on trial for blasphemy. She's been given a death sentence. Because she's a Christian and because she won't conform to the expectations and demands of Muslims around her. She's been through several appeals. And in nearly every case for many years, judges excuse themselves at the last minute because they wanted to acquit her or have the charges dropped, but they were afraid that if they did so, they would be killed. So that Pakistani state is being cowed by Islamist extremism. And you know, I'm sure, of the many heroic, brave Pakistani politicians and judges who have spoken out against this misuse of blasphemy law and have defended religious minorities and who themselves have been assassinated. Assassinated in the name of religion. So for all these reasons, this is why I'm a humanist and a secularist. I believe it's absolutely important that we have a separation of religion and the state. So the state does not privilege or give access above all others to people of faith. And it's very sad and tragic the way even in this country, even in Britain, since Tony Blair came to power and continued by David Cameron, religious organizations have privileged access to government. And written into some of our fine equality laws are exemptions, qualified, limited exemptions, that's true, but exemptions nonetheless for religious organizations. Why should religious organizations be above the law? These exemptions don't just apply to places of worship. They also apply to faith-run schools, hospitals, nursing homes, and shelters for the homeless. Now, I will defend people of faith 
against discrimination and persecution, even though I do not share their faith. But I do not believe that they should be above the law. The law should apply to everyone equally. That is an essential requirement for a cohesive, democratic, egalitarian society. When I look around the world today and I see the role of organised religion, as I mentioned earlier, wherever religion has political power, it oppresses others. So in Iran, for example, we have a Shia Muslim dominated state which persecutes Sunni Muslims, Ahmadiyya Muslims, Sufi Muslims, and others. Conversely, in Saudi Arabia, we have a Sunni dominated state which persecutes Shia Muslims. Let's not pretend that we are perfect. Here in Britain we don't have rampant persecution, but the Church of England does have privileged legal status. It is the established church, the official state religion, and 26 Church of England bishops sit in the House of Lords unelected as of right solely and purely because they represent the established church. The British legislature is one of only two legislators in the world where clerics sit as right in the parliament. The other is, of course, Iran. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen here in Britain a succession of Islamist organisations promoting a very hardline interpretation of Islam. But even some of the more moderate organisations have colluded. So, for example, every year in London, there is the Global Peace and Unity Conference, which is organised by Islamic organisations, some of whom are fine, others which are a bit dodgy. The point is, there are many good speakers at this Global Peace and Unity Conference about whom I have no qualms. I've got no problem with most of them. But some of the speakers, some of the speakers hosted at this Global Peace and Unity Conference in recent years, have openly advocated killing women who have sex outside of marriage, killing Muslims who turn away from their faith, killing those who commit so-called blasphemy, and killing LGBTI people. How come they are put on the platform? Even worse, why on earth did the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, sponsor that conference? Why have politicians from all three major political parties spoken at that conference alongside those eight preachers? And why did the Metropolitan Police and the City of London Police sponsor that conference? It's unbelievable. It's like they were sponsoring a convention of the British National Party, which of course they never do. But when it comes to Islamist extremism, there are too many people in the British establishment who give those people a free pass. That should not happen in a democracy. There is no place for those who incite or encourage violence, killing and other human rights abuses against other human beings. As you know, I'm, I'm not a gayist. I don't see the whole world in terms of gay rights only. But you will recall that in the period of the last decade or so, where we've seen some stupendous, extraordinary, amazing gay law reforms, which have got rid of centuries, in some cases, of discrimination against the gay community, religious organizations have spearheaded the fight in favor of maintaining discrimination and against equality. So all the major faith leaders from Orthodox Judaism, <coughs> to the Church of England, the Catholic Church, and Muslim organisations lined up to oppose gay equality with regard to the age of consent, ending the ban on gays in the military, allowing same-sex couples to foster and adopt children, civil partnerships, protection against discrimination in the workplace, and the provision of goods and services, the repeal of Section 28, and the end of criminalization of same-sex relationships. On all those issues and a few more, the leaders of the main religions in Britain are 
opposed equality. And I'm sure you all remember last year and the year before the disgraceful role they played in trying to scupper same-sex civil marriage. That legislation had nothing whatsoever to do with any faith. It was about civil marriages in register offices. Yet religious leaders took it upon themselves to say that the state must bow to their prejudice and maintain a ban on same-sex marriage. That was an open, overt support for discrimination. Now, we have a big debate about religion and how to interpret and understand it, but if I look at the holy texts for what they're worth, I see that most of them actually, the core values are love and compassion. Discrimination is not a religious value. Yet the leaders of these main religions support discrimination and fought tooth and nail with the most obnoxious foul campaign to try and deny gay people equality. Saying things like it would undermine and insult heterosexual marriage, that it would lead to polygamy and bestiality, that parents would end up marrying their children. These obscene, filthy accusations came from esteemed religious leaders. You think about it. You think about it. The upside is that the majority of people of faith in this country did not agree. In 2012, there was an opinion poll taken by, I think it was YouGov, or I think it was YouGov, yep, um, which asked people of faith, do you support same-sex civil marriage in civil ceremonies in register offices? 55% said yes. A complete contradiction to what religious leaders were saying. A complete contradiction. So religious leaders who oppose same-sex civil marriage were out of touch with their own faithful. And there were a handful of religious organisations that did support same-sex civil marriage. The Unitarians, the Quakers, the Metropolitan Community Church, and liberal and reformed Jews. I salute them, I thank them, their support was valued. But they were a very, very small minority. The major religions, the major religious leaders, rather, were against equality. It's a very, very interesting contrast. I'm sure that most of us would defend people of faith if they were suffering discrimination and persecution, whether in this country or abroad. Because we have humanitarian values and we believe those values are universal. And indeed, on many occasions, I've defended, for example, Christian street preachers who've been arrested for saying things like homosexuality is immoral or that um, the law should be against same-sex relationships. Now, obviously, I disagree with what they're saying. But in a free society, they have a right to say that. Provided they're not doing so in an aggressive, harassing manner, provided they're not threatening violence, I will defend their right to say those things. So in the case of Harry Hammond, a Bournemouth street preacher, who was arrested and convicted for saying, stop homosexuality, stop lesbianism, he was convicted under the public order laws for saying that. I totally disagree with him. But I offered, on free speech grounds, to speak in his defence at his trial. Sadly, Harry Hammond was so homophobic, he didn't want <laughs> I'm sure you also remember the case of the Christian bed and breakfast owners who refused accommodation to a gay couple. They're turning the whole thing around. Now they claim that because they were not allowed to discriminate against gay couples, they are the victims. So the perpetrators of homophobia are now claiming to be the victims. You know, what a bizarre, bizarre logic. And it isn't just these bed and breakfast owners. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Carey, is taking the same view. He's saying that Christians are now a persecuted minority in Britain. What absolute nonsense. He should reserve that for Christians who are being persecuted in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. 
It shows how Orwellian doublespeak has infected or been co-opted by some of our religious leaders. Just as I oppose Christians discriminating against gay people, I would equally oppose atheists or gay people discriminating against Christians. If a B&B owner refused to serve a Christian couple because they objected to their faith, I would say that's utterly wrong. That in law, we have to have, for a cohesive uh, social solidarity, we have to have a principle that if you provide a public service, you have a duty to not discriminate. Once you start making exceptions, where do you end? We could end up, if that was the case, we could end up with, let's say, Orthodox Jews or Muslims who work in supermarkets at checkout, refusing to serve customers who had alcohol or pork in their shopping basket. We could have solicitors who objected to gay people or to divorce, refusing to hand, handle cases of discrimination against gay people or men and women seeking divorce. That would be our recipe for chaos and division. We have to preserve the principle of equality for all under the law, and ensure that we are all entitled to the same rights and the same responsibilities, whether we have a faith or not. Whoever we are, the law should apply equally. So in conclusion, when I take this look around the world and I see what organized religion does in this country and in many others, I do see it as a major threat. Of course, you know, for most part, the religious right is not engaging in acts of terrorism like ISIS or Boko Haram, but they are saying that in certain circumstances, other people, as I said, particularly women and gay people, are not entitled to human rights. And that is an attack upon fundamental freedoms, which they would never tolerate if that discrimination was being directed <coughs> against them. So my appeal to people of faith is, be careful what you ask for. Because if you sanction discrimination against others, one day you might find others sanctioning discrimination against you. That is not what we want for anyone in our society. We want human rights for all. Thank you.